We've come a long way in our studies through the book of Revelation, haven't we? Welcome to Through the Bible. Our teacher, of course, is Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year journey through God's Word. You know, in recent studies, we've witnessed the end of the devastating Great Tribulation and the glorious and victorious return of Jesus to earth. And now in chapter 20, we have a true peace on earth as he reigns for a thousand years. But now those thousand years are coming to an end. What happens next? Well, spoiler alert, something crazy happens. So Dr. McGee is going to lead us today through Revelation 20, verses 9 to 13, so we can find out. And we're going to learn about an unbelievable rebellion. In spite of the peace on the earth, those who don't know the Lord will rebel at the end of the millennium when Satan is released from prison. You know, there's no doubt that Satan is alive and active on the earth today. News media gives us just a glimpse into some of the spiritually dark regions under Satan's control, and yet we know that no darkness is so thick that the light of God's Word can't penetrate it, including Middle Africa. So before we begin our study, Greg and I have some good news from that part of the world. It seems like everywhere around the world we have good news it's to bring. It's blossoming and like the it rose. It is, and that's because God's Word does not return void. And this week, as you said, the World Prayer Team is traveling through Middle Africa with stops in Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, which used to be known as Zaire. And my wife was actually baptized there on a mission trip wow. in the Congo River. Yeah, that's right. So little known fact. A little, little bit of not... Harris trivia there. Exactly. In. Uh, also Gabon and the Republic of the Congo. And today, of course, in Angola. Well, praise God for how the word is flourishing since you mentioned Angola. Praise God that even as many false doctrines run rampant, God's truth is being shared and the church is being built up in spite of really the slow recovery from 40 years of civil war that's permeated that culture. Just think about it, 40 years. I mean, that's yeah. that's a couple generations in that part of the world, nothing but civil war. Yeah, and you also have horrible things like landmines that are still there from the civil war that are killing and maiming people, lack of infrastructure, yeah. poor education, and just a general kind of uh, miasma of fear and poverty. It's, it's really, a, a, it looks like a dark situation, but we have some good news. Yeah. Bring. Now, how many people do you know that speak African French that you've had a conversation with. Not a lot, actually. Well, yeah. I happen to have a clip of Dr. McGee's Through the Bible program in African oh, French. excellent. Let's listen to it now. À travers la Bible, une série d'enseignements tirés de la Bible, préparés par... And Steve, we've been doing this recently on the program because we want our listening family to hear what Through the Bible sounds like in different cultures. And we always emphasize that we're not just trying to recreate uh, this exact English program in another language. We're trying to create a, a program that sounds like it was made in that culture for that culture. And that's exactly what it is. Yeah. And as always, we love getting responses. And so we're yes. going to focus on the African French responses we've gotten. Here's the first one I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. Love that greeting. Yes. Good Shows greeting. he understands and has been listening. I thank the Lord for your preaching, which delivered me from the fear of telling the truth. When I started preaching, like you, by telling the truth and denouncing the work of Satan and the false prophets, the elders, quotes, of my community began to respect me and praise me, saying, they like what I say. I now understand that being afraid to speak the full word of God makes us weak. Hmm. It takes courageous preachers to do this. Thank you so much. Without you, I was not going to get there on my own, but with you at my side, I am unafraid and bold for the sake of the gospel. Wonderful. And as we often talk about, there's so many false gospels. There's a prosperity gospel. Africa is full of doctrinal error, and it's just great to see a man embracing this teaching and speaking up. Now, here's another great one. My country is terrified because of COVID-19. Well, that could be said of a lot of countries. Welcome to the club. Uh, It goes on to say, people move from one side to another seeking security. Some are desperate, not knowing what to do, and listen to preposterous suggestions by false prophets. But we, as Christians, are blessed because we have the Word of God. We listen to the Through the Bible program. 
Even the non-believers have started listening and realizing that Jesus is the only solution for the challenges of the world. So encouraging. Greg, let me pray for us as we begin our, our study today, and specifically for the people in Angola. Heavenly Father, we pray for the ministry that goes out in African French into Angola and the surrounding areas. Pray that you would continue like this believer that we read today, who's emboldened because of the teaching of your word, uh, that you would reach many other men who are doing that, as well as people who are not in leadership and teaching positions. We pray now for the program as it goes out in the study of Revelation, that you would bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today we come back to this portion of Scripture that we considered so important, and we've been already two times in this chapter 20 that we have no farther along than the ninth verse, and we actually didn't complete this section at all. And again, I want to read this section beginning with verse 7 because it's so important, and here you have the last mention, very frankly, of the thousand years, and here it is. And probably I should say yes, and let me read now. And for my translation, and when the thousand years are ended, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, shall come forth to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the war the number of whom is as of the sand of the sea. And they went up over the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. Now, we explain this rebellion after the millennium as revealing how terrible the heart of man is. You remember Jeremiah said the heart is desperately wicked, Who can know it? And you and I do not really know how vile we really are and how separated we are and that we have an old nature. And that old nature, you just can't bring it into subjection to God at all. The carnal mind, Paul said in Romans 8, 7, is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, these are folk that have lived under ideal conditions with Christ reigning. And I think they got a little tired of it, very frankly. I think when he reigns, as we've said, he's really going to be a dictator. You're going to stay in line or else. And they didn't like staying in line. And therefore, when the opportunity was offered to them to rebel, why, they rebelled. And it reveals the power of Satan and there followed them. Now, the rebellion is labeled Gog and Magog. Now, many Bible students identify it with the Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, very candidly, I think this is just due to the fact that the names are the same. But this is not possible at all, for the conditions described are not parallel as to time, as to place, are participants. Only the name is the same. The invasion from the north by Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39 breaks the false peace of the Antichrist and causes him to show his hand in the midst of the great tribulation. Now, that rebellion of the godless forces from the north will have made such an impression on mankind that after 1,000 years, the last rebellion of man bears the same label. In other words, that began Armageddon, really. It was a war, not just a single battle. Now, we have passed, I think, through a similar situation in this century. World War I was so devastating that when war broke out in Europe again, and included many of the same nations and even more, it was labeled again World War. It was the same name, but it was differentiated by the number two. World War I, World War II. And now you hear people today predicting World War III, and the Scripture says it's coming on this earth. Now, the war in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is Gog and Magog number one. And the reference here in verse 8 is to Gog and Magog, number 2. 
just because the names are the same. This is a different war. This is the last rebellion of Satan. And I'm sure that just because they bear the same name it does not mean that they are the same. In my family, there were so many Johns on both sides of the family that my mother decided that I should be J. Vernon McGee. The J, many people ask, which stands for John. And I never was called John because there were too many Johns around. And that doesn't sound good, but that's exactly what it was. And so I was named J. Vernon. Now, just because we had similarity in names doesn't mean we're the same person. I had an uncle on one side, an uncle named John, had a grandfather named John, in fact, two grandfathers named John, and my dad's name was John. So you can understand why I bear that name of J. Vernon. It had to be separated from that crowd. Now, we have here in verse 9 the dropping of the last atomic bomb. The phrase here, from God, is actually not in the best text. It simply means that natural forces which destroyed Gog and Magog number one, and if you'll check back with it, you'll see that it was natural forces, it will destroy Gog and Magog number two. You can check, actually, there were certain plagues that God brought on them. There was the rain of hailstones from heaven. Now, this last rebellion and resistance against God was as foolish and futile as man's first rebellion in the Garden of Eden. Here, it is not the beginning, but the ending of man's disobedience to God. It is the finality of man's rebellion. Nothing remains now but the final judgment. And so we have here in verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where are also the wild beast and the false prophet and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now this is a most solemn statement and it's rejected by this lovey-dovey age in which we live today but it is a relief to God's child to know that the enemy, both his and God's, will at last be brought to permanent justice. There's nothing here to satisfy the curiosity or the sadistic taste. The fact is stated in reverent reticence, which to me is awe-inspiring. If man had written this, having said this much, he couldn't have restrained himself from saying more because today all of these things that Sir Robert Anderson called the wild utterances of prophecy mongers. You see men today, they go farther than the Word of God. The Word of God is very restrained. Very little is said about this subject of hell and actually of heaven. But we're going to see heaven next time. Now, there are several facts here that contradict popular notions. First of all, the devil is not in hell today. He is the prince of the power of the air. He today is the one that controls this world to a large extent in which we live. God has limited him, of course, today in the great tribulation. He'll have full reign for a while. Now, in the second place here, he's not the first to be cast into hell. We saw the wild beast and the false prophet preceded him by 1,000 years. And then finally hell is described as a lake of fire and brimstone. Now the Lord Jesus is the one who gave the most solemn description of hell. Will you listen to these verses? Luke 3, 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, now, this is, of course, John the Baptist. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now, in Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then Matthew 8, 12, But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, it ought to make anyone stop and think, how can it be utter darkness and still be a literal fire? 
For you read in Matthew 13, 42, and he shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then again, the Lord Jesus in Mark 9, 44, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now, to me, that fire is a picture and it is the best symbol that could be used of the reality. Sins that men have committed in the spirit, for instance, how are they to be punished in the body? I think that outer darkness is to be separated from God and to look back upon a life that's been misspent in this world. And can you think of any fire that would be hotter than for a man to be in hell and to hear the voice of a son of his say, Dad, I followed you down here. I want to say to you today, this is a solemn thing. A man said to Dr. Bill Anderson, he says, suppose that we get over there and find out that this is not true at all. Well, Dr. Anderson said, then I will just have to apologize and say I must have misunderstood the Lord. But he says to the man, suppose we get over there and I'm right and you're wrong. What about it then? May I say to you, friends, that's the thing that has kept a great many men sleepless at night. What about it if this is true? And friends, it is true. This is the Word of God that we're looking at. We love John 3.16, but what do you think about this? I think that Fire is a very poor symbol of the reality of what it means to be lost, separated from God for eternity. Now, you can't reduce these descriptions to something less than the reality. And I would not accept anything less because always a symbol is a poor representative of the reality. And you can't dissolve this into the thin air of make-believe. The reality far exceeds the description, and human language is beggarly in trying to depict the awful reality. Hell is a place. It's also a state. It is a place of conscious torment. Now, that is the language of the Word of God. You can't escape that. Now, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Now, this is the great white throne, and this is what men mistakenly call the general judgment. But it's general only in the sense that all the lost of all ages are raised to be judged here. All the saved have been raised in the first resurrection. And that's made clear here, that even the tribulation saints have part in the first resurrection. This is the second resurrection. And these are raised here for judgment. The lost are raised to be given an equitable, fair, and just evaluation of their works in respect to their salvation. I said to a man on his deathbed right here in Pasadena years ago, I was asked by his wife to visit him, and he says, Preacher, you just don't need to talk to me about the future. I'll take my chances. I believe God is going to be just and righteous. Let me present my works. And I said, you're right. He is just and righteous, and he's going to let you present your works. That's what he said he's going to do. But I says, I have news for you. At that judgment, nobody's saved because you can't be saved by your works. When you stand in the white presence of the righteousness of God, your little works will seem so puny that they don't amount to anything at all. My little grandson brought into his grandmother the other day some flowers that he'd picked. And I want to tell you, they were a sad-looking bunch of flowers. And with great pride, he gave them to his grandmother. And his grandmother patted him on the head and thanked him for the lovely flowers. And when I looked at that scene... I couldn't help but smile, but I also immediately recognized how solemn it's going to be when a lot of these goody-goody boys are going to stand in the presence of a Christ they've rejected with their little bitty bouquet and expect that he'll be a grandmother to pat you on the head and say, what a smart boy you were. My friend, this is solemn and this is serious. You need a Savior to stand into his presence. 
You need to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Don't you know we are sinners? We are lost. We're in a world of it. We like to compare ourselves with other people. I'm as good as the Joneses down the street. Sure you are, but you ought to know about the Joneses. It was Samuel Johnson that said, every man knows that of himself, which he dares not tell his best friend. You know yourself, don't you? You know things that you've covered up and smothered that you wouldn't have revealed for anything in the world. Well, the Lord Jesus is going to bring them out at this point. While you are presenting your little bouquet, he's going to tell you about yourself. You need a Savior today. Now, will you notice, this is the great white throne, and the holiness of this throne is revealed in the reaction of heaven and earth to it. They roll up as a scroll. The one sitting on the throne is the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, how do you know? The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And he hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and they'll come forth, they that have done good. Well, what is the work of God? To believe on him whom he has sent. Those are the ones that have done good. They've accepted Christ. And then they come forth unto the resurrection of life. That's the first resurrection. We've talked about that. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of what? Of damnation and condemnation. That's the great white throne judgment. Now, he says here, verse 12 and 13, I saw the dead, great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were open. Sure, you're going to be able to get a fair trial there, friends. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in him. And they were judged, every one, according to their works. My friend, may I say to you, your life is on tape. And he happens to have the tape. And when he plays it back, you're going to be able to listen to it. And it's not going to sound good to you by any means. Are you willing to stand before God and have him to play the tape of your life? And also, I think he'll have it on television there for you so you can see it, too. You think that your life can stand the test? I don't know about you, but I couldn't make it. Thank God for the grace of God. That's the only way. Now, John says here, the dead are classified as the small and the great. They're all lost, for evidently none have their names written in the book of life. They had never turned to God for salvation. And the Lord Jesus said that in his generation, ye will not come to me that you may have life. These had not come. And there are books which record the works of all individuals. God keeps the tapes, and he'll play them at the right time. And I want to tell you that there are a lot of politicians that are going to have their tapes played in that day. And there are going to be a lot of us preachers that will have our tapes played in that day. And I want to tell you, we're not going to be happy about it at all. But if you're saved, you don't go before this judgment. Your works are to be judged as a child of God at the judgment seat of Christ, which took place during the Great Tribulation. This is the judgment of the laws. The Lord Jesus said, You'll not come to me that you might have life. And these didn't come. And multitudes want to be judged according to their works. And this is their opportunity. The judgment is just, but no one is saved by works. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Multitudes have gone to a watery grave in which the chemicals of their bodies have been dissolved in the waters of the sea. And you say, how can it be raised? Because some of it's in the Atlantic and some's in the Pacific. Well, God will have no problem with that. After all, they're only atoms. He just has to put them back together again. He did it once. He can do it again. The graves on earth will give up their bodies. And Hades, the place where the spirits of the lost go, will disgorge for this judgment. And it's a frightful judgment. And I'm not quite through with this chapter. I've got almost to the end of it. But I'll finish it next time. And then... 
We're going to change the theme song. We are going to heaven, friends, and look at a glorious scene that is there, the new Jerusalem. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. As Dr. McGee said, I can't wait to go to heaven next time. It's going to be an amazing study because we'll see Jesus in the new Jerusalem and all evil will finally be removed from the earth. How's that for a teaser? Well, until then, you can find a ton of Bible study materials in the resources section of ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'll meet you back here tomorrow as we make our way through the Bible. Jesus made it Our journey on the Bible bus today is supported by the prayers and gifts of fellow passengers as we travel through the Bible.